Hi guys, I'm back and um, now we're going to talk about climate change in the current earth environment and the kind of projections that we have about the impacts of how the atmosphere and the climate it's, itself will be changing and also how that might be impacting um, other earth systems. So I'm going to share my screen. And we're going to start right here. Um, okay. Oh, wait. We're going to start right. Sorry, one second. Here. Okay, so as we learned about already, there's a very close connection between the greenhouse gas concentration in the atmosphere and the temperature of the atmosphere because greenhouse gases. Um, trap energy in the infrared or heat energy form. And so we have been tracking, we've been recording um, the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere um, since the late 50s. Um, and there is a particular guy um, named uh, David Keeling, or maybe Charles David Keeling. I don't know, there's a father and son. I forget which one's name is which. Uh, but they work for the Scripps um, Institute of Oceanography out of San Diego, and they set up a research study out in the middle of um, the Pacific Ocean in Hawaii, because they figured that was a fairly kind of unpolluted air system. And they started tracking um, the concentration of carbon dioxide over time. And this is what we have recorded over the last approximately what, 60 plus years. Um, and we can see, first of all, that there's a seasonal variation to this. And we saw some of this in the videos um, that I asked you guys to look at um, before. But basically, in the Northern Hemisphere, there's a lot more plants because there's a lot more land. And in the summer, those plants soak up a lot of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So the global carbon dioxide drops. And then in the wintertime, when the leaves fall off the trees, they're no longer photosynthesizing at the same rate. And then also those leaves start decomposing and re releasing carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. The carbon dioxide comes back up. So there's this kind of seasonal, yearly, up and down wiggle that we see in the data. But beyond that, there's this very consistent, kind of undeniable upward trend of the carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. So this is not something that's disputed by scientists. Um, it passed 400 ppm, which means parts per million um, of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere um, a few years ago. And now we're up about 415 parts per million. And this is much, much higher um, than we have seen it at any time since anatomically moderns have, humans have been around for about the last 200,000 years and then going much farther um, back um, to almost a million years or at least 800,000 years. So here's this kind of longer um, record. And unfortunately my video is kind of obscuring the little, the peak of this, but I showed you this graph last week. Um, and it shows that we are now over 400 parts per million. And that is way out of proportion with the other kinds of carbon dioxide variability that we had been observing in the atmosphere for most of the last million years. So the carbon dioxide has always changed. It's always gone up and it's always gone down. It's always had climate impacts. But now all of a sudden we are just kind of taking off like a rocket and shooting kind of way beyond the past natural variability. Okay, so we know that this has impacts to the temperature of the land. We know there's this close causal correlation um, between um, the temperature changes and the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Um, we have already seen that on average, the Earth's surface is about 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit, which is approximately 0.85 degrees Celsius warmer than it was when we first started recording temperatures in a very systematic way in the late 1800s, so over the last 100 years. Um, this is a simulation um, showing um, the changes um, in the temperature. So areas in yellow are about one degree um, warmer than the average global temperature over the last about 100 years. Areas in um, orange or red are more like two degrees Celsius warmer. And then areas in blue um, are cooler 
than the average global temperature over the last 100 years, or 135 years, I should say. Um, so let me see, how do I start this video? Wait, no, I can't go back. Shoot. See if it's gonna play here. Huh? Here we go. So starting off 100 years ago, it was considerably cooler, about two degrees Celsius or four degrees Fahrenheit av on average cooler than most of the temperatures we have today. We're proceeding through the middle part of the last century. When I was born in the 80s, and then the last couple decades have just been very notably hotter um, with the kind of hottest areas up in the Arctic um, where they've seen the greatest amount of heating. Okay, so we call these temperature anomalies. If something is anomaly, it's kind of different than expected or different than average. And so um, this is a, diagram put out by NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association, um, and it is showing the land and ocean um, temperature anomalies um, that we have seen, um, and this particular graph is showing data from um, 2016, and so we can see generally that we have warmer than average conditions, and then in these places that are dark red, we have the warmest ever recorded conditions. And we do have some places that are cooler than average. We have a complex Earth system. And so not everything exactly follows the same trend. But on average, there is an undeniable warming trend that is very consistent and that is very um, um, pronounced. So another way to envision this is if we think about um, the warmest years that we have on record, Again, remember, we started globally recording temperature in a systematic way in the late 1800s. So we have about 100, coming up on 140 years of data now. And of all those years that we've recorded data, the hottest 10 years were 2016, 2019, 2015, 2017, 2018, 2014, 2010, 2013, 2005, and 2009. So all of those um, within the last um, 15 years. So we have a very pronounced warmer um, condition than we have seen um, in kind of the modern industrial era and also in over, as, we, as far as we understand, over human history. Okay, so how does this fit into a historical context for Earth? So we said this is definitely warmer than we've seen in the last um, 140 years since we've been using thermometers to record the temperature of the Earth. But we've used these climate proxies to help us understand the um, temperature of the Earth in the past as well. So we talked about climate proxies last time, like ice core data. And so the Earth is uh, about 4.6 billion years old, and the Earth has been much colder and much hotter than the conditions that we see um, today in the past. It has varied. Um, the conditions on the Earth's surface have varied widely as the earth has been much colder and much hotter. So as the temperature changes, we shouldn't expect to live in the same earth conditions that we are accustomed to. But here's two graphs. The bottom one is showing the earth going back about 800,000 years. So this is kind of the time over which we have ice core data for. And we can see that there's actually two periods of time, one about um, point one four million years ago, which would be about 140,000 years ago, and one about 0.4 million years ago, which is about 400,000 years ago. Though we actually had temperatures um, on the Earth's surface that were slightly warmer than the temperatures that we see today. So they were approximately, um, or less than one degree Celsius warmer than today. But those were warm times that were correlated with peaks in CO2, and remember those peaks in CO2 were much lower than the peak in CO2 that we're seeing today, but I just wanna acknowledge that. 
Also, if we go back and look at the top graph and we go back about 5 million years, we can um, observe an Earth that was warmer than today. And that blue line is going up higher than the zero mark all the way up to close to one and above one, um, but below two. So that's telling us that the average global temperature over 5 million years ago was at least one degree Celsius, approaching two degrees Celsius, warmer than today. And what's concerning about that is that we've also done research um, about those particular periods of time um, that tells us that things like the sea level um, was considerably higher. So we'll mention this more later when we talk about sea level, but in these warming periods, that existed 140,000 and 400,000 years ago, we have evidence to believe that the sea levels were as high as um, like 20 feet higher than today. Um, and going back 5 million years, we have evidence to think that the sea levels were more like 80 feet higher than today. So if we're on this trajectory, um, we could be looking at much, much, much higher and rapidly changing sea level conditions. Okay, so the next data that I wanna go through is um, collected from what's called the IPCC, which stands for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, so this is an international body that was set up by the United Nations Environmental Program and the World Monetary Organization back in the late 80s. And it is a collection of volunteer authors and leading science, which are leading scientists in their field. So they went, not, it's not a, just a United States thing, it's an international group of leading scientists in the fields of oceanography, atmospheric science, um, biology, chemistry, um, and they all work together to research and report out um, on kind of the, the state of the science on climate. So there are hundreds of contributing authors and reviewers. So there's a very extensive peer review process that goes into the reports that this um, group puts out. And the goal of this group is to synthesize and present the best science on climate change to inform policymakers in all the different um, countries of our globe. And what they have concluded, um, especially in the last big report that they put out, is that the warming of the climate is unequivocal, which means there is absolutely no doubt among the scientific community that we are on a warming trend. Um, and this is some information that was put out in their last major report, um, which was um, a 2013 report. And so the graphs that I'm going to show you are from that report, um, and they um, are particularly from the summary of policymakers. Um, which is kind of a more abbreviated version of the port, which is hundreds of pages long. Um, they're working on a new report. They put out kind of an interim report um, about a year ago, um, but it wasn't as extensive um, as the report in 2013. Um, and so I'm gonna kind of refer back to that report. Okay, so first of all, I just wanna acknowledge that um, this report, as well as a lot of other scientists, or a lot of other science works on models that make projections about the future. So we have not been to the future yet. We do not know exactly what the future will hold, but we can use information, we can use data, um, looking at what happened in the past and looking at um, how different variables in the past influence past conditions, and then we can help make predictions about what's gonna happen in the future. So just like weather forecasting, weather forecasting isn't perfect, but it does give us a pretty good idea of what we could expect, and we would be wise to heed um, the advice of weather forecasts that say it's gonna snow, or it's gonna flood, or it's gonna be a really hot day, um, and we depend on those kinds of forecasts all the time. So um, the IPCC does a lot of forecasting, okay? And so um, in particular, they don't just make one forecast for the future, but they make a range of forecasts of what we might see in the future, depending on different, what they call RCPs or representative concentration pathways. And basically these re represent potential future greenhouse emission scenarios. So depending on technological advances, depending on policy decisions, 
um, depending on social decisions, we will have similar amounts of greenhouse gas emissions in the future, higher amounts of greenhouse gas emissions in the future, or a much lower green amounts of greenhouse gas emissions in the future. And depending on which trajectory we're on, we're gonna see different impacts to the Earth system. So a lot of the graphs that we'll see in this report will show um, lines that first of all represent data from the past. So in this particular graph that shows global average surface temperature change, first of all, it shows the historical data, the data from 1950 to 2000 shown in a black line with a gray area around it. So they have the black line is what they know, the gray area around it, it shows that there's some you know, imperfection in the way that they've calculated this data. So there's probably a range around that prediction that the true value falls in. And then going into the future, we have these range of different trajectories that we could be on based on our political um, and societal decisions. And those are gonna take us kind of on a lower trajectory of warming, which would be correlated with the RCP 2.6 trajectory. So that would be um, the conditions where we massively kind of decarbonize our economies, um, our transportation sectors very rapidly, and we get off CO2 emissions and carbon dependence um, right away. Most people don't think that's realistic. Um, we're hoping to be moving in that direction, but it's probably gonna take a little bit of time to transform our energy and transportation sectors. Um, then the red line shows kind of a business as usual scenario. We don't really make any effort in this scenario to change what we're doing. We just go along um, with business as usual. So if we make a very kind of Herculean effort to decarbonize our economy and our industry and our societies, what we could see is that we could limit our increase in um, warming by the end of the century to only about one degree Celsius, which is about two degrees Fahrenheit. That's where that kind of blue line hits on our graph, okay? That would be the best possible case scenario that most people think is not realistic. If we go upon our business as usual trajectory, we'll hit about four degrees Celsius um, increase, which is, corresponds to about an eight degree on average Fahrenheit increase, okay? And that would be very um, problematic for lots of reasons that we'll discuss next. Most people think we'll probably land somewhere in the middle of this range, but this gives you an idea of kind of the relationship between policy decisions that we make and the potential outcomes that we might find and shows you a little bit about what projections um, do. Okay, so first of all, we already kind of went through this graph, so I'm not gonna talk about it in detail again. This is the same graph that we saw on the last page, but this basically tells us what should we expect from our changing temperature on our planet. And what we know is that it depends on what emission scenario we are on, which depends on our political and social decisions, depends on technological advances as well, okay? But we're gonna see somewhere in a range between at very minimum a one degree Celsius increase and, a, and as much as a four degree Celsius increase, which we already said would correspond to about a two to eight degrees Fahrenheit increase on average. So some places in the world will warm up more than that, even in the best case scenario, and some places in the world will warm up a little bit less than that. Okay, so what does this mean for other parts of our Earth system? So first of all, for the cryosphere, which is the part of our Earth that's covered in ice and snow, we know that warmer temperatures mean ice and snow melts, right? That's a very kind of simple connection that we've all observed in our own life, okay? So the Northern Hemisphere sea ice, how much um, sea ice could we be losing over the North Pole? Again, depends on our emission scenario, um, but estimates range from, in best case scenarios, losses of about 50% of our ice cover, and in worst case scenarios, basically a complete loss um, of our ice cover. So that would be 
um, a very extreme difference, first of all, in habitats there, but then also in the albedo and the reflectivity of our planet and the energy budget of our planet, which is going to have future implications for climate change in the next century. Okay. Um, I'm going to put this clip um, on um, our Canvas site for you guys to watch, but there was a documentary that came out in 2012 um, that shows all this time lapse footage of um, glaciers melting and it's really interesting to see what this actually looks like in person. I think a lot of this kind of sea ice and glacial loss is very um, kind of abstract to those of us who don't live around major glaciers and so um, there is this interesting project that um, went out over a number of years and took kind of time-lapse videos of how the ice systems were changing um, and I'll show you a clip of that video in Canvas so you should go check that out. Okay, so the next scenario, um, the next thing we know that's happening is sea level rise, okay, as I mentioned in the past. Um, we're aware that in past times when we had warmer climates, we saw significant sea level rise. And what we'll see by the end of this century, so, you know, in the period that might be within your lifetime, again, depends on the emission scenario that we choose, depends on our political, social, and technological decisions. Um, but the range that we could see is somewhere on the range of a 20 centimeter increase. And remember that this is a vertical increase. The whole sea gets 20 centimeters higher, not just like the edge of the sea creeps 20 centimeters up the beach. So in a low lying island nation or parts of the US, for instance, that are very, very close to sea level, a 20 centimeter increase could really cover a lot of land area. And then in the kind of the business as usual scenario, we'd be looking at something closer to a one meter increase in sea level rise. And then again, I'd like to remind you that this is all the data that came out in the 2013 report. And most of the data that's come out more recently shows an even more extreme sea level shift. So this would be a very conservative guess about what our sea level change might look like. And just to review, um, the reason that the temperature of the air impacts um, sea level is one, that warmer air um, melts more ice, as we talked about on the last slide, and that ice um, melts and then flows through rivers into the ocean. So we literally just fill up our ocean with more water. But then also what's going on at the same time is that warmer water actually expands. The molecules of water actually push apart from each other when they're a little bit hotter. They're moving around a little bit faster. They're pushing apart from each other. So the ocean water also literally expands and it also takes up more space and rises because of that. So it's a combination of expanding water and then filling up um, kind of the tub of our ocean that are contributing to the sea level rise. Um, here's a prediction that was put out by NOAA. So again, this is not the international report. This is our national report. Um, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association. And this is showing projections of what sea level rise would look like for the part of our country that would be most vulnerable. These are low-lying areas um, along kind of the Gulf states and the East Coast. Okay, so um, our government expects that by 2100, um, we'll see somewhere between 0.2 and 2 meters increase in sea level rise along the Gulf Coast. This will probably displace about 8 million people, okay? Um, and about 10% of the global population lives within only 10 meters of the current sea level. So looking to the future, we have a lot of very vulnerable populations that are living very, very close to sea level. And um, this particular image is showing in red the areas that would be impacted with two meters of sea level rise. So places like Miami and New Orleans would be completely underwater. Um, and then orange would be four meters of sea level rise. So that's probably something that we won't see in our lifetime, but could see in the next century um, and so on and so forth. So showing the areas that would be inundated. And again, these areas might not look huge compared to the size of the United States, but these are areas where we have lots of urban centers and lots of people currently living because coastal environments are historically places where we had big ports and lots of um, trade, and so lots of people are concentrated in these areas. 
Um, okay, so what do, what do we expect for rainfall, right? Climate is um, more than just temperature. So again, all these things depend on the emission scenario since we don't know the political and other social decisions that we're gonna make about how much greenhouse gases are gonna be released in 50 plus years. We don't know exactly what we're gonna find. Also overall, um, the system of precipitation in the atmosphere is a little bit more complex than temperature. It's related to temperature, it's related to water holding capacity, it's related to air circulation. And so we have less um, certainty around our predicted changes to precipitation than we do about our predicted changes to temperature. We have extremely high confidence about our predicted changes to temperature, and we have lower confidence about our predicted changes to precipitation. But the two kind of signals that seem to be emerging from all the research is one, that we'll probably see kind of a separation where drier areas will see even less precipitation and then wetter areas might see even more precipitation. Okay, so you're gonna just kind of see a more exaggerated climate than what you already have. And then also what we'll likely see as a warmer air mass is able to hold more moisture in the air longer is that it won't release rain in as many events. So we won't have as many days of rain throughout the year, but we may have a similar total amount of rain, but that rainfall will come in a fewer more extreme events. So we might have a smaller number of days. In California, we already only get most of our precipitation in 15 days. And then those rainstorms might be fewer and then even more concentrated so we could get these really intense rainfalls in maybe only like eight or 10 days. And unfortunately, those really intense rainfall events create problems with flooding, create problems with landslide, and then also landslides, they make it more difficult for us to capture and store that um, water in soils, um, in snowpack, um, in reservoirs when it's not as spread out throughout the year. So that's kind of what we're um, predicting. Um, changes to average precipitation here and these two scenarios um, showing the percentage change. So um, yellow and red areas are gonna be getting even less precipitation before and then blue and green areas are gonna get even more precipitation from, than before. So this is just another way to visualize what this might look like. Um, okay, other expected changes. Um, could be related to things like loss of biodiversity. Um, so we know that um, species are adapted to live in specific ecosystems. Uh, and as the ecosystems around them change because maybe ice is melting or just the temperature is getting warmer and maybe plants are blooming at different times or plants are burning more rapidly, um, then those species may not be as well adapted to live in that environment anymore. Some other new species might come in to kind of take up the space that other species were occupying in the past. So overall, we think this is probably not beneficial to most organisms on the earth that won't be able to adapt or move quickly enough to keep up. And we've already recorded a huge loss of species on our planet. Um, a lot of that is not necessarily totally related to climate change, but is related more to habitat loss um, and overharvesting by humans. Um, and this um, kind of trend of massive um, biodiversity loss is sometimes referred to as the sixth extinction. We have five other extinction events that we've recorded in geologic history where the fossil record of organisms shows many organisms living and then very abruptly many, many organisms dying off. And we seem to be on the trajectory to be experiencing another sixth extinction within this century. So by the time you die, we may have lost as many as 50% of the organisms that we had on the planet um, at the start of the Industrial Revolution, which is a pretty stunning thing to think about. Um, but then also remember that as the climate is changing, we may have the expansion. Certain organisms might be moving into new areas or doing better in areas where they struggled before. And unfortunately, some of these organisms that are moving are probably going to be like pests 
for certain kind of insects that act as disease vectors. So this particular um, graph on the right is showing um, the kind of current territory where um, the mosquitoes that carry malaria have the ability to survive in yellow and then red being the area where we think these particular mosquitoes will be able to inhabit in a sustainable way by 2050. So we can see that is kind of expanding into many areas in the United States. Um, and so obviously we have some concern about what that might be um, or what that might mean for public health. Um, another thing that I wanna mention is that um, this also might have impacts to other kind of extreme weather events like hurricanes and wildfires. Um, we know hurricanes are storms that um, build up when we have really warm ocean temperatures at the end of the summer. So if we on average just have warmer oceans all the time, we have every expectation um, that we will have more of these hurricane storms. And unfortunately we have already recorded over the last um, two decades that the, the rate of these storms um, is increasing. And then also if drier areas are getting drier and we're having warmer and longer summer periods, we also will expect to see more big wildfires. And unfortunately we have also already seen over the last decade or so that we've had some really um, damaging wildfire seasons. And anyone who lives in California is very intimately aware of what that might look like and what that has looked like. Um, so um, just to kind of support those points I made, first of all, this is going back to changes in um, certain kinds of pests and disease vectors. This is, um, a chart that is showing the expansion of corn rootworm. So this is a particular worm that impacts corn plants. Corn is extremely essential to our both economy and then all the different kinds of food as well as energy um, systems that we depend on or many energy systems that we depend on. And this is showing what an expansion of um, kind of corn borer would look like. So this is um, of concern to people that grow corn and then people that eat and depend on corn. Um, so that's something to consider, right? This is a huge portion of our animal feed that we have in our country, it makes ethanol, um, we eat corn straight up, and anyway, it has lots of um, purposes. And then this is a chart that's showing um, changes to these extreme weather events. So this is actually um, a a chart that was is collected by the insurance industry. So the insurance industry is very interested in tracking these extreme events because they are often responsible for paying out when these um, damaging events happen. And um, this is a little bit out of date, only goes up to 2012, but basically it's tracking from the 1980s, the number of these extreme level events. So not just every fire and every flood, but these kind of major events and we can see that the geophysical events, things like volcanoes um, or tsunamis or earthquakes, right, things that are related to movement of the earth that are unrelated to climate um, or are not caused by climate, at least I should say, um, don't really seem to be increasing. Those are shown in red. And then meteorological events, things like storms or hurricanes do seem to be trending upwards. Hydrological events, big floods or landslides in green, also seem to be increasing. And then climatological events, um, extreme like heat waves, droughts, and forest fire also have been increasing. So this is bad news for the people that live in the communities where these natural disasters are occurring. It's bad news for the economy that's paying out billions of dollars after these extreme um, natural disasters. Um, and so there's a lot of concern um, amongst people, um, not only about how this could damage humans, but how these kinds of events could be very, very damaging to the future of our economies. Um, this is a graph that's more um, specific to wildfire because this is a phenomenon that we're so intimately familiar with in California. So this is showing data back to the 1970s. And then the black line is showing changes in temperature. And then the red line is showing the incidence of major wildfires in the spring and summer, or in the year, I guess. Um, and so we're seeing, first of all, as the black line goes down, we usually have a smaller number of wildfires. And as the black line goes up, we usually have a 
larger number of wildfires. And then we can certainly see throughout the 80s, 90s, and 2000s that one, the temperature is higher, and then also the number of wildfires is higher. So we also know that wildfires can be related to forest management decisions, um, but there is a very strong correlation between temperature, um, which really um, relates to kind of the dryness of the fuels in the forest and the length of the summer season over which fires might occur. And so there's a lot of concern um, about what our fire seasons might look like in our future. Okay, so the, and this last major IPCC report, um, kind of the two main takeaways that were the big headlines from the report um, said, first of all, that the warming of the climate system is unequivocal. So we mentioned that at the beginning, but just to review, there is no scientific debate that this warming is happening. It's very well recorded um, globally, okay? And then the second big takeaway, which is something that had been more controversial, um, not, not widely in the scientific community, but among a few loud voices, was is the climate warming related to human activity or is it related to other natural forces? And all the scientists that looked extensively at the data said that the human influence on the climate system is clear. The amount of greenhouse gases that we are pumping into the atmosphere is unequivocally related to the warming that we're observing. And so the decisions that we make about continuing to pump greenhouse gases into the atmosphere are going to have very um, pronounced impacts on the kinds of um, earth system changes that we may be experiencing. So these are major takeaways um, that we have from this report. Okay, so I'm gonna stop there and give you guys a break.